That's good. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord for this is God's day he made for you, for me, for us. And we are here together again, doing what we always do, giving him the praise, honor, and the glory because he is good all the time. And all the time, our great God is good to us. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, Father God. Yes, it's cold. Yes, it's it's snowy and all of that, but it doesn't matter. It does not matter what the day is, hot, cold, warm, in between. It doesn't matter because we love you. We honor you. We praise you because you are our God, our Father, and you are God good. You've given us another day and it's a beautiful day and we give you the praise. Bless us now in our time together is a prayer. We pray in Jesus name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. We are on an exciting quest. It is a quest I'm calling the making of Martin. We are exploring who and what it is that made MLK Jr. the great man that we celebrate today with a national holiday. And what we have discovered thus far is that greatness is something that grows. Did you hear that? Greatness grows. It does not happen overnight. Greatness grows and develops within a person as it is nurtured by people who helped to instill character into him at a tender age. People like his parents, who he witnessed to stand up against injustice themselves, and at the same time, with great integrity, they meticulously instilled in him the great truth they practiced from the Bible. Love your enemies. Oh my, oh my. They personified loving your enemies, forcing him to grapple at a young age with how it could be possible to love a race of people who hated him and were the cause of so much injustice to him personally, to his parents, and to his people. All of this shape the making of Martin, but it was also his years at college that continued to mold and make the adolescent thinker. <laughs> so listen to Martin's own words of the impact his college years had on shaping the great civil rights leader. And as we do, I want you to think about the people and events that had, have helped you to become who you are today. Martin writes this in his autobiography. At the age of 15, I entered Moore House College. My father and my maternal grandfather had also attended Moore House. So Moore House has had three generations of kings. I shall never forget the hardships that I had upon entering college. For though I had been one of the top students in high school, I was still reading at only an eighth grade level. Hmm. I went to college from the 11th grade. I never went to the 12th grade and skipped another grade earlier. So I was a pretty young fellow at Morehouse. My days in college were very exciting ones. There was a free atmosphere at Morehouse, and it was there I had my first frank discussion on race. The professors were not caught up in the clutches of state funds and could teach what they wanted with academic freedom. They encouraged us in a positive quest for a solution to racial ills. I realized that nobody there was afraid. Important people came in to discuss the race problem rationally with us. 
when I went to Morehouse as a freshman in 1944, my concern for racial and economic justice was already substantial. During my student days, I read Henry David Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience for the first time. Here, in this courageous New Englander's refusal to pay his taxes and his choice of jail rather than support a war that would spread slavery's territory into Mexico, I made my first contact with the theory of nonviolent resistance. Fascinated by the idea of refusing to cooperate with an evil system, I was so deeply moved that I reread the work several times. Mm -mm -mm. I became convinced that non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as cooperation with good. No other person has been more eloquent and passionate in getting this idea across than Henry David Thoreau. As a result of his writings and personal witness, we are the heirs of a legacy of creative protest. The teachings of Thoreau came alive in our civil rights movement. Indeed, they are more alive than ever before. Whether expressed in a sit-in at lunch counters, a freedom ride into Mississippi, a peaceful protest in Albany, Georgia, a bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, these are all, all outgrowths of Thoreau's insistence that evil must be resisted and that no moral man can patiently adjust to injustice. Mm -mm -mm. Once again, we are forced to pause, we got to pause to reflect on the impact one person has on the life of another, helping to shape his thinking, which in turn informs his actions and ultimately the actions of an entire movement for civil rights. So here we see the reconciliation of two seemingly opposite things. We see how the force of love for one's enemies can be manifested in such a way as to bring about change in those same enemies. Peace combined with protest, love combined with action, singing combined with marching, possible because of the people involved in the making of Martin that would allow him to declare in the face of great opposition and death threats, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. My, oh my. But suppose Henry David Thoreau had not written that book so that Martin was able to read it. My, oh my, we may not have had the Martin that we have today. What about you? What is in your heart that God is pressing you to do that may seem to be something very simple, but do it. You don't know what impact it may have on someone else. That's why I'm so proud of Eleanor writing her book of poetry so that we have that beautiful book. And you don't know, Sister Eleanor, who may be impacted in reading your poetry that may change their life. Martin continues, as soon as I entered college, I started working with the organizations that were trying to make racial justice a reality. The wholesome relations we had in the intercollegiate council 
convinced me that we had many white persons as allies, particularly among the younger generation. I had been ready to resent the whole white race, but as I got to see more white people, my resentment was softened and a spirit of cooperation took its place. Mm -mm -mm. I was at the point where I was deeply interested in political matters and social ills. I could envision myself playing a part in breaking down the legal barriers to Negro rights, an inner urge calling me to serve society. Wow. I think that is the Holy Spirit tugging at his heart. Because of the influence of my mother and father, I guess I always had a deep urge to serve humanity, but I didn't start out with an interest to enter the ministry. I thought I could probably do it better as a lawyer or doctor. One of my closest friends at Morehouse, Walter McCall, was clear about his intention of going into the ministry. But I was slow to make up my mind, even though I did serve as assistant to my father for six months. As stated above, my college training, especially the first two years, brought many doubts into my mind. It was then that the shackles of fundamentalism were removed from my body. More and more, I could see how I could see a gap between what I had learned in Sunday school and what I was learning in college. My studies had made me skeptical, and I could not see how many of the facts of science could be squared with religion. I also revolted against the emotionalism of, of much Negro religion, the shouting and stamping. I didn't understand it, and it embarrassed me. I often say that if we, as a people, had as much religion in our hearts and souls as we have in our legs and feet, we could change the world. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. I have seen that most Negro ministers were unlettered, not trained in seminaries, and that gave me pause. I had been brought up in the church and knew about religion, but I wondered whether it could serve as a vehicle to modern thinking, whether religion could be intellectually respectable as well as emotionally satisfying. This conflict continued until I took a course in Bible in which I came to see that behind the legends and myths of the book were many profound truths that one could not escape. Two men had profound influence in my life at that time. Mm -hmm. Let me say that. Two men had profound influence, Dr. King says, in my life at that time. Dr. Mays, M-A-Y-S, president of Morehouse College, and Dr. George Kelsey, a professor of philosophy and religion. Both of them made me stop and think. Both were ministers, both deeply religious, and yet both were learned men, aware of all the trends of modern thinking. I could see in their lives the ideal of what I wanted a minister to be. Mm -mm -mm. He had a living model, an example that he could emulate. My, oh my. Mm -mm -mm. I am forced, therefore, to interject here once again and ensure that you heard the impact these two men had on Martin. I will refer to them as disciples of Christ because they lived out the gospel in such a 
tangible way, it was visible to a young skeptic, changing the course of his direction for his life. So you can therefore anticipate the question I'm going to ask you. <laughs> when others look at your life, what are they reading? Are they seeing an authentic follower of Christ that inspires them to emulate you? And in so doing, they are then able to manifest the greatness that is within them as a result of you manifesting the greatness that lies within you. Without these men to shape his life, Henry David Thoreau, Dr. Mays, Dr. Kelsey, the young, impressionable Martin Luther King Jr. may not have been fully formed into the great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Martin goes on to say that because of their influence, this is what occurred. In my senior year of college, I entered the ministry. <laughs> I had felt the urge to enter the ministry from my high school days, but accumulated doubts had somewhat blocked the urge. Now, with the inspiration from Dr. Mays and Dr. Kelsey, it appeared again with an inescapable drive. I felt a sense of responsibility which I could not escape. I guess the influence of my father also had a great deal to do with my going into the ministry. This is not to say that he ever spoke to me in terms of being a minister, but my admiration for him him was the great moving factor. He set forth a noble example that I did not mind following. I still feel the effects of the noble moral and ethical ideals that I grew up under. They have been real and precious to me. And even in moments of theological doubt, I could never turn away from them. At the age of 19, I finished college and was ready to enter seminary. Oh my, oh my. Woo. Mm -mm -mm. Woo. So listen, a call to action today is a call to introspection. Neither Dr. Mays nor Dr. Kelsey had the prominence of Dr. King. In fact, we don't know their names <laughs> other than we just mentioned them because of his autobiography. Yet we feel their impact through the life and legacy of their student. Our lives are enriched because of the lives of Dr. Mays and Dr. Kelsey, even though we do not know them and they do not have the notoriety of Dr. King. So inspect your life because your impact, you impact and influence the lives of those you come in contact with. What is your life inspiring others to do? What is your life inspiring others to become? Their greatness was manifested in their character and integrity, seen and observed by Martin so that he desired to emulate them. Is your character and integrity such that others want to emulate you? Prayerfully, you can answer that question in the affirmative so that today can be a fabulous Friday for those inspired by the greatness of your life and your example. Shalom, everybody. Have a beautiful weekend. Shalom. Shalom, Dr. Denry. Great meditation all week, Dr. Denry. Thank you. Bye. Have a blessed day. Thank you, Enjoy Brother Wade, weekend. Brother Kenny, <laughs> Ali, Roslyn. Blessings on you. Thank Sister you. Mr. Benjamin, blessings. Stay warm Bless and you. safe.
Thank have you. Day, All right, Brother Ray. Have a beautiful day and weekend. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye now.